Before we go into the podcast, I want to just talk about a business that I've set up with my friend George. Uh, It is called the Podcast Introduction Group. So if you want to join and be able to be featured on 24 to 48 podcasts to be able to reach an amazing audience, this is the place you need to go to. Podcast being a guest on podcasts is automatically establishing you as an authority and is able to build your personal and professional brand. We hand pick of a bank of podcasters that we have to be able to grow your business and brand. We do 100% of everything that needs to be done by my team. You do not need to lift a finger. You are able to expose yourself to new and relevant markets by going on other people's podcasts. You also are able to create brand loyalty. People will love listening to you and coming back to your products or services and it's able to increase your revenue. So if you want to be able to get involved, you can sign up quickly, registered with a with an account manager. There's an onboarding call where we target the podcasts that you want to be on, the type that you want, whether it's entrepreneurship, business, health, fitness, whatever it is. We then match you to those podcasts and you can start your journey. We have regular catch-ups with our account managers and Google ranks you when people search for you. So when people are searching for you, you're able to see your podcasts at the top of the list. So if you are interested in being a podcast guest on multiple podcasts, we are the place to go. If you go to podcastintroduction.com and go and register your details, we will have uh, a quick call with you. Uh, match your your podcast that you want to be on and we can then start this process ASAP. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Back onto the podcast then. Just one last thing before we go into the podcast. I just wanted to talk to you about the fact that I have a YouTube channel that has been going for quite some time and I am recording and releasing all of my interviews with some short videos as well on YouTube. So please do check it out. YouTube on Absolute Business Mindset. You'll see a bunch of interviews there, all the longer format interviews and some short videos as well. So please enjoy that. And here goes with the podcast interview. This is the Absolute Business Mindset podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Michael Freed, who is a diamond buyer's best friend with Diamond Pro. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. So let's go straight into your education. So you said just before we started that you actually did a degree in business and administration. Uh, uh, first business it, and accounting, yes. Oh, sorry, business and accounting. So why did you choose that subject? And you gave me a bit of an insight before we started. Why didn't you pursue it or why did you uh, not pursue it any further? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in New York and uh, spent uh, my time. I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish community, and usually people there kind of fit into certain categories of what they're going to do with their future. And uh, a lot of people end up going into accounting and finance, and that seemed to be the best fit for me. And I guess uh, about one or two years into university, I I quickly realized that uh, it was not for me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why? Why? Why did did you not like the accounting side? Did you not like the course? Did you not like the teaching? Um, your... I didn't like being uh, forced into uh, just looking at a spreadsheet for the sake of looking at a spreadsheet. Uh, I liked I liked the idea of being in, in moving more towards a a corporate job or a business job that had many different facets to it. Right. And did you finish your your course? Or yes. Did you before yes. You, did, you did. And has it actually helped you in your in your diamond business having those sort of base core skills? Oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, having fundamental knowledge of accounting and 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 business in general always helps inform inform your decisions. Um, 
being quick to understand certain things like uh, cash flow and, you know, debt to earnings ratios and, and whatnot always helps you when you're looking at a business. And, and we'll get into it, I guess, a little bit later, how the diamond industry works. But, um, you know, it, it definitely helped me manage my little fiefdom, if you will, when I was working on the corporate side of the business. Right. Okay. Um, so you, you, you said you started in a diamond shop as a part-time at university. What attracted you to the, the diamond industry? Uh, the availability of a job. Uh, my, <laughs> it was actually a, a, one of the largest diamond manufacturers in the world. Okay. Uh, my uncle worked there and he managed to get me a job. I, I was doing admin work uh, to start out. Uh, it was just really part-time trying to pay some, some of the exorbitant fees that, that go with university in the United States. And, uh, and who was the person that taught you about the, the clarity and, and, and all the facets of diamond? So it, it was actually really interesting. I, I started out, uh, as I mentioned, an admin, uh, and I kind of picked up a lot of things on my own. And one of the salespeople was going out um, – to, to meet with uh, one of the largest uh, one of the largest retailers in America and their diamond buyer to sell to sell diamonds they hurt their back and I had dealt with this diamond buyer over the phone a few times and the salesperson asked if I can go in his stead and sit with the with the clients because they didn't want to lose out on the opportunity yeah. we prepared you know four or five million dollars worth of diamonds to show to show them. And I went out and I developed an instant connection with the person there. And I ended up developing this relationship further. And essentially that account got handed over to me. And one day the, the head of the company who was based in Israel uh, was in the New York office. He walks by one of the sales offices and notices that the largest client of the company or the second largest client of the company was sitting in a room with somebody he didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, he went in there to just find out what was going on. And, and the, the diamond buyer from that company was effusive in her praise for me. And later that day, the, the head of the company uh, brought me in and said, hey, you're coming to Israel and you're going to actually learn about diamonds. Wow. And I spent a year training probably the most vigorous way possible to, to learn everything you need to know about diamonds. And what does that actually mean, actually being trained to have knowledge on diamonds? So most people, when you walk into a store as a consumer, people there might talk about getting a, a, a certificate from like a kind of like a, a certification from one of the laboratories that, that offer training courses. That is not a, a particular deep uh, understanding of the diamond business. What they teach you in those courses is uh, the, really the technical aspects of the diamond, where you learn about you know, how the cut, you know, interacts with each other and how it's going to make the diamond brilliant, how to grade color, how to grade clarity. Uh, what we were doing uh, on our side of the business was really understanding the value of a diamond. Uh, the first day I was in Israel, I was sat down in a room. Uh, it was called the sorting room. And the, the, manuf the, the diamonds that came back from the polishing factories uh, were just poured out on your desk. You would start with about a thousand diamonds and I was just told, separate them into bright color and dark color. And that's what I did for the first couple of weeks. And then I had to refine that even more. And then I slowly did that where I was sorting them out into specific grades of color. And then I did the same for clarity, do it for really ugly, really nice. And then just really started to get into the finer details of it. And after months of doing this, um, essentially what we're doing is we're assigning value to each diamond. So I'm looking at diamonds and I'm saying, okay, this goes into the, the thousand dollar inventory. And this goes into the $1,200 per carat inventory. This one goes into the $1,400 per carat inventory. And once I was sufficiently knowledgeable with that, I took a few trips with uh, some of the people who went and negotiated five or $10 million uh, purchases of diamonds in India from other diamond uh, diamond polishing companies. And we would sit in a room. Often it was a large safe. We were locked into there with this $10 million box. And there was no way to go through the whole $10 million. And we had to do a quick, you know, one hour, two hour inspection and basically give, our, give us an, give an estimate as to how much we thought that box was worth. And 
afterwards, we would then bring it to our office in, in Israel and figure out how profitable or how, uh, how unprofitable the purchase was. So when you're dealing with that, it's, a, it's about negotiating the right price for the diamonds. Yeah. Diamonds. Diamonds. So first, the first thing you have to do is understand from our, from our point of view is how valuable the diamonds are. And then we have to understand how va- from, I wouldn't say an objective point of view, but from a strictly you know, value what the open market, uh, mm-hmm. how much it's worth. And then you also have to look at it from the subjective point of view of, you know, what clients do we have that are looking for specific types of diamonds? Because diamonds are, you know, they're not all the same and different companies sell different types of diamonds. And, you know, I might have an order for very low quality diamonds. So I'm not actually there to look for for better diamonds. I'm looking to fill an order of a million dollars worth of what we would call frozen spit for, for Walmart. We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X Men, that's X Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. Right. And and something you said earlier on, you, you would categorize them into a thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars, fourteen hundred yeah. dollars. Can you actually tell that amount of difference on a metric of just two hundred dollars? Uh, yeah, pretty easily. I, I, when I'm when I'm talking about the thousand to twelve hundred dollar, I'm referring to I'm referring to smaller diamonds. Okay, and well, I mean the, the metrics between just two hundred pounds, you can cl- clearly see. Well, it's a twenty percent difference. Yeah, yeah, it's very it's very easy. So so essentially, you know, m- most people have heard of the the diamond color and diamond clarity. At least when they're we're start, start starting to look for diamonds. Uh, so. Looking at the difference, you know, diamond color is graded D to Z, but most of the time you're looking at D to K color diamonds, uh, and and clarity is uh, flawless down to I1. And we would pick, you know, the difference between an H uh, that we would, we what we would have is what's called parcels. We would have a folded piece of paper that was like an envelope, mm-hmm. and we would put all the diamonds that are a specific quality into that parcel. And we would have a, a, an inventory number for that. So let's say our line 17 was a GHVS quality. And those diamonds were worth, if they were 35 pointers at the time, they were worth $700 per carat. And the, uh, the J color SI quality was worth, um, you know, let's say, I don't know, 650 or 600 so we would know the difference between those. Obviously, when you get into larger quality diamonds, you know, the, the diamonds that you're looking at individually, a one carat plus uh, 4,000, 5,000 pound diamonds, those we don't divide up into, into uh, values. We give them specific color grades. We, we, I would evaluate it and say, this is going to be a GSI one if we send it to the laboratory for grading. Right. And what's the the fluctuation in price within diamonds? You, you mean historically or based on quality? Uh, no, what I mean is in in the market, what something might be five thousand pounds to like six months ago is that always five thousand pounds, or is there any sort of flux like a like with the price of gold or the price of um, of of a, of, a, of, a, of something that you you mine? Is, is there fluctuation in prices throughout a year, let's say? Well, there is fluctuation, um, but I, I wouldn't compare it necessarily to gold or other, or other minerals because those are, uh, those are uh, traded uh, in the investment circles. Yeah. So the price of gold isn't necessarily de- defined by supply and demand. Yeah. It's also defined by prospecting. You don't really have that in diamonds because as there's just so, such a variety of qualities, it's very difficult for people to invest the same way that they would with, let's say, gold. And gold is just a commonly accepted standard that people trade trade easily. Yeah. So 
most of the fluctuations you see in price on gold have absolutely nothing to do with the supply and demand of gold. Mm -hmm. Uh, It has to do with, um, you know, let's say the weakening of the dollar or the pound and people want to purchase something that they think is more stable. And you don't have that with diamonds. You don't have that with diamonds, but there is a supply and demand. Uh, Prices, historically, every decade, they've, they've grown in price. Right. Um, at least at the rate of inflation, possibly, possibly more, uh, you know, that will fluctuate, uh, the last few years leading up to 2020, the prices were actually going a little down and at surprisingly, uh, post COVID we've seen a, an enormous jump in, in prices. And that at first had to do with the fact that a lot of the factories shut down. They were scared of the economic impact of COVID and, People stopped uh, manufacturing diamonds, but also just the way people's uh, consumer spending has shifted over the last two years, you've seen an enormous growth in purchase of luxury goods. And uh, we're going to jump around a little bit because there's lots of things to cover on the diamond industry from from my point of view. What's the pros and cons of lab-grown versus natural diamonds? The pros are they are the same. From a, an appearance point of view, from a visual point of view, they are uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, if you if you want to get in a diamond ring, and they are significantly cheaper, so they offer much better value from that perspective. The con that I would that I would offer is that diamonds that are created by by machine are not um, they're not dependent on supply or actually they're strictly dependent on supply and demand. Mm. And as you've had economies of scale, the prices have plummeted on those. So that gives you a great deal today, but would you want to spend a thousand dollars on a diamond that theoretically can cost, you know, 60, 60 pounds in, uh, in three years, you have no idea, you know, that, that happened in the eighties with uh, lab grown emeralds. Uh, They started doing lab created emeralds and uh, that, that was sometime in the mid 80s and they became extraordinarily popular because emeralds are, are are very rare and very expensive and here people were able to get an alternative jewelry with emeralds for you know a thousand two thousand pounds and that was you know you know fantastic but as the um, technology advanced and as the economies of scale advanced all of a sudden you started to see emerald jewelry with lab created emeralds in uh, discount stores for two, 300 pounds. So it kind of cheapens the shine off of, off of the purchase that you made. So that's a risk that you're taking when you purchase a lab grown diamond. And now, your, your expert opinion, do you, could you tell the difference between a lab grown diamond and a natural diamond? No. Right. Okay. I mean, there are very slight subtle differences in the uh, the makeup, if you will, the carbon makeup of, of a lab-grown diamond, but they're so minute. Um, the only reason I would know is if I'm looking at a big pile of them. Right. You know, um, we mentioned the color scale. Uh, often, uh, natural diamonds have a, a, a usually have a natural yellow or warmish tint to them, and D is a perfectly clear diamond. And as you get lower down on the color grade. You know, let's say starting by H, I, J, certainly K, L, M, you'll see like a yellowish, warmish color to them. Mm-hmm. In lab-grown diamonds, that color grade scale is similar, but that yellowish tint has more of a slightly gray hue. It's such a minor issue. Like nobody will, nobody can tell the difference looking at it except for a diamond expert. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that's what you would see. And also the imperfections within the diamond are usually... They just look a little different. Okay. And do you do other things apart from diamonds? Do you do emeralds, sapphires, et cetera? Or we you- help people with all, with all of those, with all of those uh, products. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my ex- expertise and my training, you know, in the industry started with diamonds. But obviously, uh, in the capacity that we do now with helping consumers, they have questions about a lot of other things. So we've, we've worked hard to provide quality content for emeralds, sapphires, you know, your birthstones, your, you know, all the different birth, various uh, gifts that you would get in the jewelry world. Okay, awesome. And your website, did I read right that you have a million readers per month? 
Um, there, we have peaked at a million readers. We're usually at about seven, seven fifty. And why are you now online? Do you, do you hold stores or at all, or are you all online? We we are strictly online. Uh, we are, and we are just an advice website. We don't actually sell diamonds. Okay. We uh, we do uh, deep dive educational content, and we will help you find a diamond with uh, you know companies that we recommend online. Right, right. So you're an education business rather than yes, a, what you would call affiliate marketing. Right, absolutely. Okay, and um, and so so with your with your website, do you do you offer like do you offer how to see the four C's? What are the four C's? These are the definitions. These are what, or do you? Do you do one to one like coaching with people, or is it all information on the website? People then do their reading and then are informed of what they're doing. We do everything. We will meet the reader wherever they want uh, advice from. We have deep dive content about the four C's. We dig deeper into things that you wouldn't even think of beyond the four C's. Um, and then we would also have guides that would give you a comprehensive. Uh, step-by-step process of what you know what to do when you're buying a specific thing for example a one carat diamond or if you have a budget of five thousand pounds or dollar uh, we'll walk you through the process we have uh, reviews of most of the major retailers in the UK the US uh, and and most English-speaking countries in the world that's based on thousands of uh, secret shopping visits that I've done uh, often with uh, one of my colleagues here, we'll pretend to be madly in love uh, on a trip. And, you know, the next week I'll travel with one of my other colleagues and we'll be madly in love uh, looking at other stores. Uh, and then people are always welcome to contact us. We help we help as many people as as are willing to, to email us for, for help. And we'll, we'll go through every question that they have. We'll answer it personally. We'll pick out diamonds personally for you. Uh, we also have on our site, we have an artificial intelligence model that will actually pick out a diamond based on the parameters that we would recommend. So that's uh, that's another tool that people can use on our sites. So we're really a one-stop shop when it comes to diamond engagement rings and diamond jewelry. Do you want to just give your email address? I will ask you at the end of the episode as well, but as you, as you said it, what is your email? Well, you can contact us through uh, our, our website, uh, www.diamonds.pro. And the web. I think our email address is the pros at diamonds.pro. Lovely, thank you. Um, now, something that is concerning ethically for a lot of people with diamonds is blood diamonds, the dark side of diamonds. Yes. What What's your view on that? My view is, is, is a little complex. Um, it's, not, it's not a quick, uh, a quick answer. It's a good thing you're asking this uh, in this segment, not into a quick fire. Um, first of all, there, there, there are and there always has been and there probably always will be exploitation of people in war-torn countries where they, where they aren't developed. And there are areas, let's say in Africa, that uh, you know, they have you know, these diamonds that are sitting there, they're small, they're portable, and they're valuable. And of course, they're going to be exploited. And that's a horrible thing. And everybody should be doing whatever they can to try to minimize uh, that uh, exploitation when possible. That said, people tend to uh, make knee-jerk reactions based on, let's say, watching a Leonardo DiCaprio movie, Blood Diamond. And they're all of a sudden like, okay, diamonds from Africa are terrible. And I think what that does is it does a disservice to the people in Africa, and it kind of paints a broad brush when when a more nuanced approach is necessary. When you're buying a diamond in the UK or the US, ninety nine over ninety percent of those diamonds are coming from sixty or seventy manufacturing companies. These companies have a strict pipeline where they actually either control the mines that they're that they're getting the diamonds from, or they're partnered with one of the mining companies like De Beers or Al Rosa or whichever of the major conglomerates that are that are out there that mine the diamonds. It's a strict pipeline that goes from those 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 legitimate mines to the manufacturers who cut the diamonds to the New York or Hong Kong or UK offices where they ultimately end up in the retail stores. When you start looking 
to avoid blood diamonds that with all intents and purposes are not going to end up in your pipeline anyways. What you're doing is, is you're taking business away from some industries that are helping people in Africa develop. You're far more likely to be buying a diamond that comes from Botswana or South Africa, where those diamond interests have helped the people there immeasurably. In Botswana, for example, the money that they've made, the government has made from, they have a legitimate stable government for, for quite some time. And the money that they've, that they've made from the diamond uh, industry has been used to essentially eradicate AIDS. Uh, they've seen their HIV pop, you know, uh, infection rates drop dr- drastically over the last 20 years. Uh, the average, the average wages and the quality of life is far greater in the areas where they have these diamond mines and these diamond cutting factories in Botswana than you would in other areas in Africa. So when you walk into a store and you say, well, I don't want to buy a diamond. And, and by the way, if you say, I don't want to touch the industry at all, that's a perfectly valid response. My problem more is a lot of companies that do um, what I'd like to say, very superficial marketing that they claim to be you know, conflict-free or beyond conflict-free. Because all the diamonds that you're seeing, all the, all the major retailers in America, the, the UK, anywhere in Europe, they all uh, commit to the Kimberley process, which is making sure that their diamonds are coming from this, uh, this pipeline that, that I talked about previously. So there are companies out there that claim to be beyond conflict-free. For example, that's a tagline that I've seen. And what they're doing is they're ensuring that these diamonds are not coming from they're they're claiming that they're doing uh, they're doing more to ensure that those diamonds are not coming from these uh, you know war torn areas. What they offer on their site though are lots of diamonds from Canada and lots of diamonds from Russia. Now those pose two different ethical dilemmas for people. One is you know if you if you avoid buying diamonds from Africa, where ninety nine point nine percent of the diamonds that would end up in your store would most likely be from a legitimate business that's helping the people in Africa. And then you end up buying, buying diamonds that come from Russia. Russia doesn't exactly have the best track record when it comes to human rights. Uh, you know, Al Rosa is, is owned by the, the Russian states. You know, they, they, they have a significant ownership stake there. <laughs> you know, is, is it better to, to deprive the people from Africa and give that money to people who are threatening to invade Ukraine? For yeah. example, yeah, yeah, you know that's a that's a very complex question. Or would you rather give money to Canada? Which I love Canada. Canada is an amazing place, but that's a very wealthy country that doesn't really need that money too badly. So where are you where are you drawing the line? How are you okay. making these decisions? Okay, well, I, just to complete transparency, I have no agenda here. I, yeah. I'm I'm here to ask questions because I don't know. I'm coming from an, an, a curiosity angle rather than having a particular angle. But how much of the percentage would you say of um, diamonds globally come from corrupt or uh, um, uh, ethically void countries? Uh, in Africa, where it's predominantly yes, I've I've seen the, the the film with Leonardo DiCaprio, Blood Diamond, and and yes, that has sort of fashioned some of my thought. But just to get an idea, what sort of percentage of of the global market is coming from African war torn countries? So I don't have a specific answer for that. I don't have an exact number, but what I can tell you is that anywhere between seventy five and ninety percent of all diamonds that are coming out of Africa alone are coming from mining operations. And those are all run by legitimate organizations. Right. The diamonds that, they're, they're the other way that you can actually uh, find you know, natural diamonds, I believe it's called alluvial, uh, alluvial mining, which is uh, sifting through uh, riverbeds, kind of like what you saw in the gold rush in California. Yeah. And you can find them that have somehow come out through, through underwater streams and whatnot. So theoretically, that's the only one that's accessible to, you know, people other than the, 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 the factories. But of that, you know, we're saying that 10 to 15 percent or whatever that number is exactly from Africa is coming from alluvial, alluvial mining doesn't mean that that 15 percent is coming from those war torn countries. 
We don't know. We don't know what percentage is going to, you know, those are the only ones that are strictly out of the hands, but it's going to be a minority of that because you have alluvial mining in legitimate countries like South Africa and Botswana and other countries that have stable governments and are doing these things. Mm. And on top of that, um, you know, the, the talk of blood diamonds came out in the 80s and 90s, which was definitely fair at that at that stage. They didn't have the strict process, what we, what they would call the Kimberly process before that. And at that point, Africa was making up 80 to 90 percent of all the diamonds in the world. Now they don't even make up half. So what we're talking about is a small percentage of alluvial diamonds, which is a small percentage of overall diamonds that are coming from Africa, which is a small percentage of the overall diamonds in the world. Right. So I can't put a specific number on it, but the chances of it happening are so infinitesimally small, in my opinion, that it's not really something that you should be caring about. Now, I'm not saying you should buy a diamond. I don't buy into the diamond industry's uh, marketing on a whole that everybody needs to buy a diamond when they get it, when they get engaged. I don't agree with that. And, you know, that's something that uh, you should decide on your own. And... First of all, if that tiny infinitesimal percentage chance of buying something like that is going to bother you, then fine. That's a valid reason not to buy a diamond. Uh, there's also environmental concerns of buying anything that's mined. Yeah. At the same I'm... time, most people are making their posts that have a problem with this or saying it on their iPhones or whatever it is. You know, the working conditions in Foxconn in, in, in China that, that manufacture electronics yeah. and the natural resources that are required for all the electronics that we have in our life are yeah. also coming from questionable sources. Yeah. We all have to make informed decisions. I'm not advocating that you buy a diamond. I'm here to help you get the best value if you choose to do so, but I don't think everybody should buy one necessarily. That's that's purely up to whatever people's traditions and emotional decisions decide. I'm I'm not buying into the idea that you have to buy one. So I just think it's a it's it's a more nuanced conversation that I think a lot of people just aren't willing to to make the effort to to make come to that that you know educated decision and i think i think a lot of people are getting information and making assumptions and making that swift decisions on well all of the diamond industry is corrupt and yeah. and, and, and i i totally appreciate that that that, that isn't well I, I i'm taking your words that it's not the case um, I, th- I, I agree. We should all be informed. If we want to buy diamonds, then we should yeah. try and mitigate the circumstances where we are buying blood diamonds. But uh, as you say, there are a lot of things that are not necessarily ethically made from trainers exactly. to, to phones to computers. So um, I do get that point. But I, I think as a, as a diamond industry, you should be trying your hardest as an industry, you being part of that industry, to make it as 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 legitimate as you can and that is that that you should be thinking not necessarily necessarily think about other industries you should be thinking about how you can make your industry as as legitimate as you can i i agree 100 percent and first of all i don't speak for the diamond industry as a whole no i know uh, if anything i'm a bit of an outsider at this point um, that said, I know that the diamond industry is making attempts. I know that uh, the main African uh, mining operations, De Beers, uh, or DTC is their company name, uh, they, they're they trying to introduce uh, blockchain technology to mm-hmm. sh- show the source of every diamond that comes out of their mines. Right. Um, you know, that's something that that's, you know, it's going to take time for that to be adopted. Yeah. That's an early adaptation. The data as well. It's quite a lot of data. Yeah. To, to yeah. So that, you know, the, certain things like that. I know, uh, personally, I know of, uh, brands, uh, that I've, that I've spoken with the people. I, I don't like the companies that, that, um, offer, you know, just marketing fluff saying that they're beyond conflict free. Uh, that said, um, I've been, you know, talking with a, a colleague of mine from the manufacturing side, and they they developed a brand called Kalahari Dream, which all their diamonds come from their specific factory in Botswana, mm. and they're tracing it back. Percentages of the money that you're that you're paying for the diamond are going into that specific village and that specific region. You know, is it is it enough? A- any retail company is making those, you know, 
Yeah. Anything you're buying in retail, they're making efforts to show that they care. Yeah. And you have to make a decision whether that's enough or not for yeah, you. Absolutely. Um, what's your view on De Beers? Are they are they yeah, what what's your view on they they're the largest producer? They were the largest producer oh, okay. for, for a long, long time. They aren't anymore. It could it could be that they're the largest. They certainly don't have a majority of 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 uh diamonds anymore. Okay. As I mentioned before, Africa is no longer the majority of diamonds produced in the world. Right. Um, I think that they are the greatest advertising company of the last hundred years. Okay. And I, I don't think there's much I don't think there's much competition, to be honest. Uh diamonds are beautiful, diamonds are incredible, but this idea that you have to buy a diamond engagement ring when you get engaged is a novel concept um, that, you know, was created by their marketing agency. I was going to say, when, when, when was that, when was that created as a, as I a... don't, I don't want to be incorrect on this. I think it was in the, the, the early fifties. Oh, um, so this uh, last century, you're, you're trying within, to think... within the last hundred years, it was either, oh, it was wow. either before world war two or after world war two. Okay. It was an advertising company in New York. I think it was J Walter Thompson that created a marketing campaign for De Beers. Right. And uh, the rumor is, uh, this is uh, not confirmed, but that the whole presentation that they had for the marketing campaign was prepared for months and months and months. And they didn't have a title for it. And an intern just scribbled on the, t- on the front of it, Diamond is Forever. And that ended up being the greatest slogan of the last 100 years. Yeah. Um, and you know, just in general, their marketing has been incredible. You know, I, I don't know how it is exactly in, in the UK. Um, I know that diamond buying diamond engagement rings has grown in popularity over the last yeah, 34 yeah, years. Yeah, my job. Um, no, I've certainly, I've been to Haddon Gardens many times. I've been to a lot of your major retail chains. Um, but in the United States, uh, there's a commonly accepted principle that you need to spend two months salary on yeah. your engagement ring. And that is just a, a load of BS that was created by the diamond industry, by De Beers. And it was incredible. And I, you know, I don't agree with it. And we try to tell people that they should not be putting themselves in debt. They shouldn't be trying yeah. to, you know, you're usually when you're buying a ring, you're starting off a, a specific part of your life where other expenses are coming, you know, a house, family, and a, a, a wedding. Uh, so I strongly suggest that people uh, recommend that people do not you know, overextend themselves. Mm. But we've had questions over the last uh, four or five years uh, along the lines of, is it true that the, that the rule now uh, is that it has to be three months salary instead of two months salary? And it just astounded me that somehow this BS marketing ploy that you have to spend two months salary mm. wasn't mm. enough. Mm. And they're now convincing people that it has to be three months salary. And it's just shocking to me. So um from a marketing perspective, I think De Beers is a is an incredible company. Other than that, I just think they're they're like any other company, trying to build whatever they can and trying to, you know, make as much profit as they can. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier on and on my reading that you pride yourself on mystery shopping and and yes. and going and and testing these places. First of all, have you ever been? You said you've been to Hatton Gardens. Have you have you done mystery shopping in? Hatton I have. Gardens? I have been uh, mystery shopping in Hatton Gardens. And uh, and what, okay, what's your view on Hatton Garden? So just for clarification, any anyone who's not in the UK, Hatton Garden is a place in London. It's a, a strip, a, a, a road, um, which just has full of diamond stores, and it's it's supposed to be the place to go if you're wanting to buy diamond for your wife. Um, so, what's your view on 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 Hatton Gardens, and equally on on that part of the industry where people are selling? Um, I don't think very highly of, uh, Hatton Gardens okay. and I'm not going to say specifically Hatton Gardens. I can say the same thing for 47th street in, in Manhattan. I can say the same thing for, uh, Antwerp. Um, that industry has, has slowly died. People don't go to the insider to buy diamonds the way, the way they used to. People are buying online. People are going to, you know, major brands and whatnot, and over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, market disruptions in, in, in the diamond industry. And profit margins have been slashed 
tremendously over the last 25 years. That's that's great for the end consumer, but that's caused a lot of issues for companies like uh, retailers or middlemen that that operate in a place like Hatton Gardens. And it's put a lot of stress on them. And I found that I've had to deal with a lot of uh, unpleasant unpleasant uh, tactics that are used in, in, in places like that. I'm not going to name any specific stores. Sure. Uh, I don't want to get into any legal issues. Uh, I, I don't want to go through that. Either. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, people have seen it. It used to be in the 80s or 90s, people would uh, make a 100% markup on their diamonds. And now uh, the major online retailers like Blue Nile or James Allen, they're probably making something in the world of 15%. So, you know, Blue Nile used to be a publicly traded company. You were able to see their gross profit and net profit. And that was about what it was. And that's caused, you know, a, a, a huge drop in retail prices or a more competitive uh, pricing uh, landscape. Uh, at the same time, a lot of middlemen have been squeezed because of globalization. It's easier for people to go to the major manufacturers in Israel or, or India. So where does that leave the people in Hatton Gardens? Uh, they can make less money, which doesn't help as rent and costs have risen dramatically in London, or they can find different ways to charge more for the same diamond. Okay. And what you'll see is a lot of efforts, you know, for example, they'll use a less, a less uh, stringent and less consistent uh, laboratory to grade the diamond, okay. which will give them an inflated quality claim. So you think you're getting a great deal on a high quality diamond when in reality you're overpaying for a lower clarity diamond, a lower quality diamond. Uh, I just uh, actually just did a test where I took diamonds. GIA is considered the, the gold standard in the industry as the, the best uh, laboratory. I just took diamonds that were all graded I1 on the clarity scale. I sent it, you know, I had a colleague of mine send them through secret shopping we sent eight of the eight diamonds to to another laboratory, and all of them, seven out of eight, got at least one upgrade, usually two or three upgrades in quality. And you'll see a lot of these type of diamonds being sold in areas like Hatton Gardens. Um, you'll see people. Um, I also I, I do speak Hebrew fluently. Um, I've heard people, uh, you know talking about what type of diamonds to show me. And they were very low quality diamonds. They weren't like saying anything nefarious or anything like that, but I can hear exactly what the diamond was before they would even show it to me. Mm. And I know that it's low quality and cause I actually understand these things. And I would give them opportunities to point out why the diamond is cheaper. Um, and they never, they would never do that. They would never explain it to the, to the end consumer. And you have sites like mine that can give you that education but the overwhelming majority of consumers don't really understand the diamond industry and they're reliant on these companies to put the consumer's interests first. Mm -hmm. And I found overwhelmingly that they do not do that in, in areas, in, in most retailers. So it's a, uh, it's a trick. It's, it, it's, it's a tricky business to be in. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about your business, the diamond pro. So okay. let's, let's go deep into that. So, for you, you are an education, i.e. you provide information from uh, from your website and you also do, you said you would meet someone to talk to them, talk them through the different options. What what other services do you provide? What, like, what, what What's your main core of your services that you provide in your business? The core, I mean, we're meeting the consumers where they want. Uh, we, we do email and we do uh, our, our content. Um, we've also just seen that the way uh, consumers interact with content uh, on the internet and just in life in general has changed dramatically over the last five or six years. Uh, we used to see a, a huge percentage of our readers uh, emailing us for direct, direct uh, questions and help, personal help. But nowadays, the the overwhelming majority of our readers are are coming from you know their mobile phones as opposed to uh, a desktop, and people don't want to write out long emails. So what we've done is we've you know, repositioned our content on our site to uh, to really uh, help people who just want to look at the content and get passive, you know, passive recommendations mm -hmm. and click through to to our to the recommended partners that we work with. Right, right. Um, 
what how has covid 19 affected supply chain um and and and, and that in, in for the diamond industry so it COVID has, in general, affected it dramatically. Uh, the supply chain has been okay. Uh, nothing really needs to be shipped in the diamond industry. Everything's flown in because it's it's valuable and very small. Um, definitely, when COVID first hit in you know the spring of uh, 2020, uh, we saw like a huge disruption in in the retail world, and most companies just closed down for several months. They they weren't manufacturing, but you know, I, I, I'm not entirely sure how it has been in the UK. I know how it's been. I personally, I live in the, I live in the Czech Republic, and I obviously do most of my business in the UK and the US. I know that in the US, there's been a very um, asymmetrical um, economic downturn due to COVID. That people in specific industries, the service industries, and whatnot, have have really suffered. Yeah. But at the same time, people that work in office jobs have done remarkably well. Yeah. Uh, most of those jobs haven't disappeared and people were working from home, which all of a sudden uh, afforded them, uh, you know, so much more disposable income. They weren't paying, you know, I, I, I lived in New York. My sisters live in the, in the suburbs. Uh, the, the bridge between uh, North Jersey and, and Manhattan is $22 a day. And parking in the US, in, in, in New York is $1,000 a month. So all of a sudden, people are saving all this money that they're not spending there. They're not going to Starbucks three times a day, not getting lunch at their desk. They're not getting dinner, you know, half the nights of the week in the in the city. Yeah. And their kids, they don't have to pay for the after school programs and all these different things that they were doing beforehand. They've had a lot more disposable income. And, and you've seen just in general, people have stopped spending money on experiences like travel and, you know, just a general, ex general experiences, you know, going to amusement parks, things like that. And they're spending it more on product, mm. uh, just because of the way our lives have changed in the last two years. Yeah. And the diamond industry has benefited uh, enormously from that. So it's, it's unfortunate that there's been such an, uh, you know, asymmetrical economic downturn and it's really, bizarre that diamonds are doing well in this time but but that's been the case awesome um so what's your plans for the next two to five years well as as i mentioned before we're we're definitely seeing a shift in the way that uh people are consuming media and consuming content on the internet so we're trying to shift more more of our content towards uh video and we're trying to give people you know long term long form Long format videos on YouTube, short form. We're gonna we're gonna try to enter the foray into TikTok and YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels. Wow. Uh, we'll see how successful that is, but that's that's going to be our big uh, our big push in the next uh, two to five years. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, coming to the end of the interview, I ask the same six questions to all of my guests. They quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. The first one is: What's the best decision that you made? The best decision I ever made was to walk away from the diamond industry. I was uh, fed up with working on the corporate side and I just walked away. I was actually volunteering on, uh, on some farms in Tasmania in Australia. And that's when a former colleague, you know, Ira, who founded uh, our, our company, we, you know, he, he approached me with this idea that he had and that we should, we should start this. Um, it really gave me more perspective on how to help people, the, the end consumer, as opposed to working on the corporate side, which is really focused on maximizing, you know, margins and whatnot. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've been given? Um, get a job in sales. I think everybody, everybody entering any profession, anything that you're going to do in, in your adult life you're going to have to learn how to sell yourself or sell whatever you're going to be pushing, whether you're a doctor trying to convince patients that they should, you know, you know, go with a certain form of treatment. Teachers have to sell their ideas. Even if you're working in a factory, you need to learn how to, how to negotiate for a raise. Um, and I think uh, that sales experience, while I wasn't a huge fan of the corporate sales business, uh, I found it challenging, but I didn't, I didn't really like it that much. Uh, I found the uh, experience to be uh, incredibly useful for me. Thank you. Um, who's helped you most in your career? Definitely my uncle, who got me the start in, in, in the business. 
Um, he gave me the opportunity there and he's always been a good support of trying to understand the bigger picture, uh, when, when looking at our business. Awesome. Um, do you have any regrets? Um, yeah, I think I, I definitely regret. Uh, I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish community and I had this idea that I would be, uh, living the cookie cutter life, you know, working in corporate America, climbing the ranks and, you know, living in one of those, you know, the, 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 the communities in the New York area. And I never really thought about alternatives to that until I walked away from that life. And I realized how unhappy I was. And sometimes I feel like I, I wasted, you know, seven or eight years of my life, you know, pushing the corporate side. But at the same time, I got the education that I'm using now to help so many people. Absolutely. Uh, what are you most proud of? Well, I'm definitely proud of the success that our company has, has has had. I mean, the fact that we've grown to the size that we have, we were helping sell almost $120 million in, in business, sorry, 90 million pounds in uh, diamonds a year. Um, but I, I'm most proud of the connections that I've made and the people, you know, the personal connections that I've made along the way. What does legacy mean to you? Doesn't mean that much. As somebody who walked away from uh, from my religion and things like that, I, I, I don't. I tend to not focus too much on that broader picture and legacies and what's going to be passed on. So you're prioritizing where you are now, and I, I focus on the moments. Yes, fair enough. Thank you very much. And lastly, we mentioned it earlier, but where can people find you if, if they want to reach out to you? Absolutely. Um, our website www.diamonds.pro. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube, uh, the Diamond Pro and and the Diamond Pro official on Instagram. Lovely. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks.